I'm going to take a little bit of time here to grab some questions. Again, if you're new to the Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show, welcome. We want to welcome you and let us know where you're from. Again, if you're, if you're from Texas, if you're from New York, we want to know where you're from. We want to be able to, um, you know, to, to tell you hello back. So let's uh, let's look through. We got a ton of questions coming in here. So again, I feel like I feel like I'm being rude because I've got a phone and here I am talking to you. But I'm not trying I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just um, let's see. Uh, if you so one question that came in about coffee, and I think it's important to merit that if you have bone loss, that you really avoid the use of coffee. Caffeine in and of itself is a diuretic. It can cause the loss of potassium and magnesium and calcium. So again, going back to you know this stuff right here. So if you do drink coffee, I highly recommend that you only buy organic coffee and that you don't add all the other garbage to it. Um, but but preferably drink it black or or some people add cinnamon or other you know herbal things to their coffee herbal um, herbal agents to their coffee. But I don't I don't recommend if you've got bone loss that you're drinking a lot of coffee because it's going to increase or um, make the problem worse. Let's see. Yeah. So okay. So. Carol is asking, she says, she, I had osteoporosis caused by a tumor on my parathyroid gland. How should I treat the problem since the tumor has been removed? The best thing that you can do, Carol, if you still have, hopefully they didn't remove all of your parathyroid glands, that you still have those glands, is really aggressively monitor your vitamin D level. And particularly, you want to monitor your 25 OHD um, as it relates to how functional your parathyroid glands are. Because one of the things that happens is when your vitamin D levels drop, you don't absorb calcium from your food. When that happens, your parathyroid hormone will turn on and it will pull calcium out of your bone. And here's why. The, blood, the serum blood calcium level regu helps to regulate your heart. And if that level drops too low, you can actually go into an arrhythmia and it can kill you. And this is why it's important to monitor it. The vitamin D is important to absorb the calcium. The calcium, once it's absorbed into your bloodstream, can then get deposited into your bone and can go to other tissues where it also has additional functions. Calcium is not just important for, for bone, but it's also a secondary messenger. So calcium helps all of your other hormones work properly. So if you've had a parathyroid tumor and your bone loss was caused by that, if the tumor was removed, then the problem should be gone. But you do want to make sure that that 25 OHD level is being closely monitored. My advice would be keep it between 70 and 100. And I would also go back down here. Uh, well, I already erased it. So there were some other lab tests that I was talking about. One of them is your calcium level um, by using lymphocyte proliferation. So measuring your serum calcium as well, your ionized calcium, your serum calcium, and then measuring your intracellular calcium. All that's going to be important, but also the other minerals, not just calcium. So vitamin K. Uh, that's not a mineral, but it's a vitamin, but then the other minerals. Um, monitoring those and seeing what your diet has or doesn't have so that you can adjust your diet to eat those different things. Um, so hopefully that's helpful and answers your question. Let's see. So I, I talked a little bit, Jennifer's asking about steroid-induced osteoporosis. Look, it's a, it's a reality. Steroids cause osteoporosis. The longer you're on them, the more bone loss you're going to develop. So. Why are you on the steroid? It's an inflammatory disorder typically that's being that, that, that's creating an issue in your body. And so oftentimes instead of the doctor asking, well, why is your body inflamed? They don't ask the question at all. They put you on the steroid and be damned the side effects of the steroid. In essence, just be on the steroid and maybe we'll be on it for you know low dose. And again, it depends on the doctor. I've seen doses that sometimes you'll get on like a steroid dose pack where you're on 40, then they titrate you to 30, then 20, then 10, then five. But I've also seen people who are on low dose, two and a half milligrams, five milligrams of steroid indefinitely for years. And that's where the bone loss is really going to become a major, major issue. So, you know, the bigger question is ask why you're inflamed. Don't just accept the steroid. Ask the why. The big question is why is the inflammation there? What is it that I'm doing that's potentially creating this inflammation that if I did something differently, the inflammation would be subdued or would go away? or at least be less so that I would need less of the medication as an outcome to control the symptoms. Because all the medications do, 
is they mask your symptoms. They don't correct the why. They mask your symptoms. They give you, they basically, they give you a false sense of security under the guise of compassion without uh, resolving the problem. So you're, 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 you continue because the because the symptom is resolved. You continue to make the same mistakes instead of making changes as to the why of the problem. Okay, let's see here. Oh, I love this. Mary Ann's chiming in. Hello, Dr. Osborne. Phone consultation a few years ago. You changed my life with diet recommendations, B12 deficiency, cold urticaria, and, uh, and CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. A 58-year-old female took away too many medication Recommend uh, too many recommended by my other doctors, which made me much sicker. You recommended getting off of everything and changing diet. Uh, diet is a powerful thing. If you have, if you've got a chronic illness, chronic autoimmunity, chronic cancer, heart disease, uh, chronic bone loss, it doesn't matter. If you haven't entertained diet as a reason as to why you have the chronic illness, then you have not even begun scratching the surface on investigating why the illness exists. Uh, Dana's asking, if someone has CFS, uh, CFS, I'm going to assume you mean chronic fatigue syndrome, Dana, uh, but I don't want to make assumptions on your behalf, but I'm going to make that assumption. Should they stop eating quinoa? So Dana, I can tell right now that you haven't read No Grain, No Pain, because if you had that question, um, wouldn't be answered. Now, I'm not that, don't get me wrong, I'm not shaming you for asking that question. I encourage questions. Quinoa is a pseudo cereal that actually many of the proteins in quinoa mimic gluten. A lot of people with gluten sensitivity have developed chronic fatigue syndrome as a result of that gluten sensitivity. So to answer, I can't really answer your question 100% because I don't know if you're gluten sensitive, but if you are, if you've been diagnosed with gluten sensitivity, you shouldn't be eating quinoa, period, because it mimics gluten. And uh, and so that, again, that information's in no grain, no pain. If that's new news to any of you listening, uh, you need to make sure that you get your copy and read it. It'll, it'll save your life, potentially. Yeah, Doreen is asking, and I love this question. Doreen is asking, my recent bone density scan showed a 2.5% decrease in the spine and a 25 increase in bone density in the hips since the last test. Any thoughts why the increase in one area and a decrease in another? Yeah, because those tests are not all that accurate. Again, it's x-ray absorption. It's all it's measuring. number of reasons why you might get an inaccurate result on a bone scan is one, and they're, they're using a different machine. So when you go back, the, 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 these machines have to be calibrated, right? And so sometimes the calibration can be off. Sometimes they're using different machines and different machines have a, you know, although they, they're supposed to give you the same measurement, sometimes one machine over here might not be exactly calibrated the same way this machine over here is. We're gonna get variances in those outcomes. That's why I was so adamant before about saying, don't trust your entire bone health to the values on a bone scan or a DEXA scan because really it's a tool that, that should be used as a tool, not as the end all be all for making big decisions about what you should do with medication. It's one tool that measures one aspect of bone health, but not it doesn't measure all aspects of bone health. Those other labs that I was talking about, measuring nutrition, looking at those other lifestyle factors, those are the things that play the biggest role in your bone health. So there are a lot of variables that, that can play a role in, in why that scan changed, good or bad. Okay, let's see here. Okay, we're getting so many questions, there's no way I can answer them all. Um, Will going gluten-free, okay, so Harry is asking, Dr. Osborne, will going gluten-free have a tendency to raise glucose levels? My wife went gluten-free and it raised her levels. She is a type 1 diabetic. You know, it depends on how you went gluten-free or how she went gluten-free, Harry. Um, if you go gluten-free the traditional way, which is why, again, why I, I keep harping on, the, the, you're going to hear me say, if, you, if you've ever listened to me for any length of time, you've heard me talk about gluten and you've heard me use some delineations and the two delineations number one is the true gluten-free diet versus the traditional gluten-free diet and if your wife did this if she went on a traditional gluten-free diet meaning she cut out wheat barley and rye and maybe oats and maybe not and instead gravitated toward um, 
gravitated toward corn-based products and rice-based products and quinoa and sorghum and millet and some of these other grain-based alternatives that are labeled gluten-free, her blood sugar would skyrocket simply because those are extremely high glycemic types of grains. Corn and rice, probably the two that, that create the most problems with blood sugar when people initially embark on the gluten-free diet because they're following a traditional gluten-free diet, which is actually an incorrect diet to follow. I, Harry, if you haven't, I would recommend it again. And going back to this is not, I hope this doesn't sound like a commercial to you, but go and have your wife read No Grain, No Pain and compare the traditional gluten-free diet that, 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 we, that I talk about in the book versus the, versus the true gluten-free diet. So compare the two and make sure that she's following it appropriately and in the right manner because otherwise what, what is going to happen is that blood sugar is going to rise and it's going to make her diabetes a lot harder to control. And that's where a lot of people get scared, right? And they think, oh, the gluten-free diet was worse for me. And this is where a lot of doctors are misinformed. They think the gluten-free diet is more diabetic causing. No, it isn't. It's only more diabetic causing if you go to a bunch of traditional garbage-based foods that are high glycemic and you use those as the new staple foods replacing your breads and their pastas and the cereals and other things because those foods that you're replacing um, with those, you know, you're eliminating the wheat, barley, and rye, but you're not eliminating the corn and the rice. You're just replacing one high glycemic food for another one, and so it can actually, and actually, not even one for another, one for one that's probably even more high glycemic, and so it creates more of an issue with blood sugar problems. So, again, hopefully that's helpful for you. Uh, Mary Ann is asking about B12 levels. Look, the reality, she's asking about 211 to 911, and she's talking about serum, vitamin B12 levels. Serum vitamin B12 levels are the worst way you could measure vitamin B12. They're inaccurate, so they're, don't, I would not rely on those. If you're, if you're going back to this B12 and homocysteine, and you're trying to get a good assertion, or ask, if you're trying to ascertain whether or not your vitamin B12 levels are low, and that's playing a, a role in your bone loss, you have to understand that intracellular is the only accurate way to measure vitamin B12 because if you're running those serum blood tests, you're going to get an inaccurate reading. And we don't have time to get into liver redistribution tonight. Maybe for another night we can talk about that. But most of your doctors are going to look at you like you're crazy when you say order my intracellular vitamin B12 levels because they just don't study nutrition. So you might be better off ordering this as a lab. There's a lab called homocysteine. You can measure it. If your homocysteine levels are high, really high means above 11, then you're, you're looking at a potential for vitamin B12 deficiency. Now, homocysteine elevation doesn't always mean vitamin B12 deficiency, but it can. So that's one better clue or insight into your vitamin B12 levels. Another one is called MMA, methylmalonic acid. This is a test that also, like homocysteine, is oftentimes elevated in those with vitamin B12 deficiency. So it's one that a lot of times doctors will know of if they don't know how to run intracellular B12. So I would at the very minimum have them look at MMA, methylmalonic acid, and homocysteine to give you at least somewhat of a decent judgment as to whether or not your vitamin B12 levels are low. Okay, let's see here. Melody, hello Dr. Osborne. I've had severe GERD for six years. I've read your book and take most of your supplements, multinutrient zinc, vitamin C mag, berberine, yeast shield, and I am grain free. I still have GERD when I eat a semi-fatty meal. For example, duck fat, almond flour, biscuit trigger today's attack. What do you recommend? Boy, that's a big one. Melody, because it's, it's, I'm, I'm, and I'm happy that you're doing better, first of all, and thank you for buying and reading No Grain, No Pain and, and trusting me enough to take action and implement those things. But I want you to go back and read chapter 10 because chapter 10 has got the answer. And what is chapter 10? It's about biochemical individuality. You might still be struggling with GERD and symptoms because, um, because you are allergic to almonds. So like that meal you just ate, it could be that it was almond. It could also be that you may be having liver and gallbladder problems and not doing well with higher levels of fat in your diet. Many people that go grain-free actually end up eating more fat through nuts and eating more fat through animal meats and that if their gallbladders are missing or if they, their liver is compromised and they're not capable of producing bile adequately, what can happen is eating too much fat in a sitting can create these types of symptoms. So it goes back down, it boils back down to personal, uh, to, 
to individualization, biochemical individuality. So do you have a liver or gallbladder problem? Do you have a food allergy that you haven't had tested for appropriately yet that could also be contributing to damage to your GI tract? Are you on medications of any sort or any kind that could be potentiating damage to your GI tract? I did a whole piece on this a few months ago and if you go to glutenfreesociety.org and type in medications that cause gut dysfunction you'll see a whole video and a whole breakdown on the classes of medications that can cause leaky gut and reflux and, and other problems and so I again without having a deeper thorough knowledge of what's going on with you it's hard for me to say with a great degree of certainty why that's happening but those melody would be the things that I would look at first. Hi Peruse. Uh, let's see here so Solaris, hello Dr. Osborne, some doctors like to prescribe prednisone for asthma related issues. Any suggestions as an alternative to the steroids? Yeah, ask why you have asthma. You know, asthma is typically caused by, again, by choice. Now, sometimes we have outdoor uh, induced asthma where you may have severe reactions to different pollens or danders or things that are actually in the outdoor environment. And the advice I would give you then is avoid outdoors on the days where those counts are highest, those things that you're allergic to. But beyond that, for most people, understand that one of the oldest known forms of asthma is called Baker's asthma, which is actually induced by wheat. So whether or not you're gluten-free or grain-free, that would be step number one, would be to investigate whether or not there are foods that are triggering that airway inflammation for you. For a lot of people, that's what it is. It's foods inducing the airway inflammation, not something that necessarily even that you're breathing. Okay. Beth is saying, I'm too low on vitamin D from flipping hours around for too long beside being inside, so I'm working on it. Okay, I'm not sure I understand that, Beth. Maybe you can reword that question because I'm, uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Let's see here. So it looks like Jane is asking, um, I've done micronutrient testing, I'm deficient in vitamin K, vitamin A, magnesium, and several others, but B12 and D and K, I'm reacting to, um, I'm reacting to most foods and the best 12 causes rapid heart rate and anxiety. Is there some, I'm not, again, this is, um, Jane, maybe retype that because I'm not quite sure if there are typos there or if, if maybe you got in a hurry typing the question and, and maybe I'm just misreading it. Maria is asking, intense pain in my arm that feels like it's inside my bone. I've had this before. It was gone when I woke in the morning. Is this lack of vitamin B6 and vitamin B12? Um, potentially it could be, but my experience with people that have deep shooting bone pain, um, that typically is food induced. And again, in my experience, and that can also be a severe anemia. So you might have your doctor check you for anemia. and. Um, and there are different forms of anemia. B6 and B12 deficiency can cause anemia, iron deficiency, vitamin E, vitamin C, copper deficiency, zinc deficiency, all those things can cause anemia. Let's see here. Is it, uh, Heidi's asking, is it possible to ever get off blood thinners after several cardiac procedures um, and in a valve replacement? Yes, there's always hope. It's always a possibility, but it doesn't, you, you should not go it alone. You should work with somebody who's highly qualified to monitor and measure your blood viscosity so that you don't increase your risk of having another problem. Um, and that's something that needs to be tightly regulated. But yes, it is possible because there are many things that are natural that keep your blood thin. Magnesium is a blood thinner. It inhibits platelet aggregation. Selenium is a blood thinner. Fish oil is a blood thinner. These are things that are essential, meaning your body can't survive without them that naturally keep your blood thin, unlike Coumadin and Warfarin, which actually inhibit vitamin K. And remember that inhibiting a nutrient that's essential for your body to function to get an outcome to reduce your risk of developing disease can be a bad idea if you're doing it long term and not figuring out why the problem exists. So is there hope? Yes, there's always hope. You should always know that there's hope. 
Okay. Kathy, diagnosed with fatty liver disease and metabolic syndrome, is the best type of diet low-fat plant-based? No. Um, the best type of diet is not low-fat plant-based. But again, it, it could be, right? So we can't make that generalization. And simply because, why can't we make that generalization? Because if you're, if you're following a diet that isn't customized to who you are and what your needs are, then we can't we can't know whether or not it's the best diet. For that particular problem, a lot of people with your situation do best on a grain-free diet and, and a higher fat diet. Some people do better on a ketogenic diet. Some people do better on a plant-based diet. There are a lot of variables in that question that, that should be tested for by a doctor who's qualified and trained in nutrition and understands the nuances of testing those types of things to give you the best type of diet. Um, beyond that, it's about experimentation. I mean, for many people, many people will do like a rotation diet or they'll do an elimination diet. So they'll try to see, okay, what foods that I'm eating create problems and what foods that, I, that I'm lacking help me, right? And the, the best, there's three rules of nutrition that I would really, really encourage you to follow. Number one is you can't get healthy eating food that's not healthy. So ask yourself and answer this question honestly before each meal. When you're picking a food up, ask yourself the question, is this going to serve my health or is this going to destroy my health? And the answer for a lot of times is a no-brainer. And a lot of people ignore that first question. So they're picking up that soda or they're calling, you know, the diet soda, right? And they're saying, oh, it's diet, therefore it's somehow good for you, but it's full of artificial toxic sweeteners and, and caramel colors and other things. And, 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 it's not good for you. So you have to answer those types of questions honestly. Is the food good for me? Number two is, does this food make me feel better or does this food make me feel worse? And that, that defaults back to paying attention. So when you eat something, pay attention to how you feel. Learn to observe your body's reactions. Learn to listen to what, how your body talks to you. If you eat something and every time you eat it, it causes diarrhea, that's your body's way of telling you it doesn't want that food inside of you. If you eat something and every time it causes gagging, that's your body's way of telling you that's probably not the best thing for you to eat. If it causes you intense pain every time you eat it, it's your body's way of telling you to avoid it. So learn to listen to those subtle cues. You get better the more you pay attention. And the third rule is, this is one that requires really working with an expert, and that's get tested. Don't eat what you're allergic to, sensitive to, or intolerant to. And the way you know about that is you get tested because some allergic responses, some people say, well, if I'm allergic to it, I'll feel it. No, you won't. There's something called an acute allergy, which you will feel because your lips will swell, your throat will constrict, you'll break out in hives. But there's something else called a delayed hypersensitivity response, which is just a subtle inflammatory response every time you eat that food. So you're, when your body is chronically inflamed all the time and you feel bad all the time, it's really, really hard to pinpoint which food made you feel that bad or which foods made you feel bad, that bad because oftentimes it's a matter of multiple different types of foods creating the issue. So hopefully that's a helpful response for you. Okay, what time we got? We got uh, just a couple minutes left here. Marianne is asking, which basic tests help to determine if you have autoimmune disease, uh, i.e. sed rate, C-reactive protein, etc.? I'm dealing with Lyme, parasites, dysbiosis, etc. So, it's, it's not which test helps you identify autoimmune disease. Certainly there are tests that can analyze different types of proteins and, and your immune reaction to those proteins. But fundamentally, the problem with autoimmune tests for many people, not for everyone, but for many, it, it, can be hard, it can be hard to get a diagnosis because many people with chronic illness are immunosuppressed. What do I mean by that? That means their immune systems are suppressed from years of chronic inflammation. And so those tests come back falsely negative. You don't get an accurate reading because you're measuring antibody responses. You're measuring immune proteins. And if you're immune suppressed, if your immune proteins are not being produced because your immune system is being suppressed by chronic illness, those tests can be very misleading. Instead of asking the question, what tests to run to identify autoimmune disease, I like to ask a better question, in my opinion anyway, is what are the fundamental reasons autoimmune disease exists? What are they? What are the causes of autoimmune disease? There, and, and those of you who've been listening to the Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show for any length of time know this answer. You're probably reciting it right now at home. There's four categorical causes for autoimmune disease, and it doesn't matter what type of autoimmune disease you have, whether it's lupus or whether it's scleroderma or whether it's autoimmune hepatitis or whether it's autoimmune car, uh, cardioparate uh, uh, inflammation. 
Um, it doesn't matter which form of autoimmune disease that you have. You want to look for the triggers, the known triggers for autoimmune disease. And so the testing should look like this. Number one, test yourself for the category cause number one, which is food. Number two, test yourself for category cause number two, which is infection. Number three, have your doctor check for chemical reactions, in essence, environmental chemicals like heavy metals and molds and things of that nature. Number four, have your doctor check for nutritional deficiencies. Those are the four fundamental reasons, chemically speaking, biochemically speaking, that autoimmune disease is triggered. Now, there are stress factors that are involved in autoimmunity. There are lifestyle factors. There are spiritual factors, certainly, too. But if we're talking about the biochemical reasons that autoimmune disease can be triggered, those are the tests or the categories of tests that need to be evaluated first and foremost. Again, if we, if we repeat that for you, it's food, it's infection, it's chemicals, and it's vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Those things need to be ruled out on day one in order to help you answer this question right here, which is why. Fundamentally, we always want to know why. Knowing what is less important and what means, going back to your question, which is what autoimmune disease do I have? What is less important than why? And if all, known, all forms of autoimmune disease have four categorical causes, why don't we just skip to the chase instead of asking the why, because, or instead of asking what disease it is, let's ask why that de disease exists in the first place. And again, the, the thing about autoimmune disease is, it's, it's, it's a person who has one of those four triggers or all of those four triggers is gonna develop autoimmune disease eventually, and the average person who develops autoimmune disease without ascertaining those triggers ends up developing as many as six more autoimmune diseases in their lifetime. My point in saying that is that autoimmune disease changes. You can start out with one form of autoimmunity. How many of you listening, let's do a poll of the audience, how many of you listening started out with one diagnosis and then as years went by and that you didn't really solve the why, you ended up getting a second opinion that was a completely different diagnosis. If you've had that happen to you, just type one into the box just type in a one. If you've been diagnosed with one disease and then at another second opinion were given a different diagnosis, both of the diagnoses which were autoimmune diseases, but nobody asked why. If that's happened to you, just type in one. I'd just like everybody else who's listening to understand and, and have that information and be able to see just how common that really is. Yeah, the ones are coming in right now. People are typing in ones like crazy. So, okay. If you enjoyed tonight's show, that's the other thing, if you really enjoyed tonight's show and tonight's format, because I think it's a lot more helpful than me standing behind my desk and just talking to you to be able to write and to be able to draw. I'm really passionate about visual learning, and, uh, and I, hope it, I hope that you are too, because this is the new format that we're going with. But if you enjoyed tonight's show, hit that love button for me. I just want to see how much love you guys can send our way, or hit that thumbs up button if you're on our YouTube feed. And again, we have... Um, we have we have both channels coming now so if you don't do YouTube you can do Facebook and vice versa so again um, show me some love if you if you really enjoyed tonight's show and I also want to make sure that you're aware of a few things so again for, especially for you newbies if this is your first time attending the, the Pig Dr. Osborne's Brain Show we do this show every Monday night at 6 p.m. and that's Central Standard Time that's Texas time because I'm in Texas so 6 p.m. every Monday night make sure you tune in every Monday night because we don't always get an email out or the email doesn't always get to your inbox before the show begins so mark your calendar 6 p.m. set your reminder for 6 p.m. if you are not part of our newsletter you are not receiving our newsletter one of the things I would encourage you to go sign up for is our gluten-free survival kit our gluten-free survival kit it's free to you it doesn't cost you anything it just gets you the information to get you moving in the right direction and uh, all you have to do to get that pick that up is go to glutenfreesociety.org there's going to be a, a box that pops up that asks you if you want to pick up that gluten-free survival kit just enter your name and email and uh, and we'll send that to you at no charge and we'll also be sending you additional information that's very very helpful about nutrition and lifestyle and diet and autoimmune disease and all things health so I'm going to make sure that you have access to that information at your fingertips at all time the last thing I'd ask you to do is subscribe if you're not subscribed either to our Facebook page at Dr. Peter Osborne or subscribe to our YouTube page, youtube.com forward slash glutenology. And make sure you share this information with somebody else. There are 46 million people with autoimmune disease. And I didn't even get into this topic tonight, but osteoporosis, bone health is really what we were talking about. Osteoporosis has now been identified as a form of autoimmune disease, so that takes the number up even higher. There's actually a whole new field in science called osteoimmunology studying how 
bone loss is actually not calcium deficiency as much as it is an immune attack against your bone creating a massive reduction in your body's capacity to build bone. So again, we didn't have time to even dive into that conversation tonight, but I want that's why I want you to subscribe to get more information because we're going to be having this conversation in, in much more depth in later shows. Then the last thing is if you don't have your copy of No Grain, No Pain, if you haven't picked it up, I can't emphasize this enough. The book is in five different languages. It's an international bestseller and you need to get a copy and when you come to the show to learn, it's the premise. It's kind of the backdrop for everything that we talk about. And I, and I don't want you to come to the show, and this is no offense, but a lot of people sometimes they'll come to the show and they haven't read the book. And if you haven't read the book, this isn't an offense to you, but they're, they're chiming in with the conversation and they're giving incorrect information to other people who are asking questions. And I just don't want that to be the case. If, if people are coming in and you're not quite sure, don't answer complex questions for other people if you don't know what a true gluten-free diet is. I just want to keep that misinformation away from the people that are here to learn. So come, come to teach, but if you want to come to teach, you've got to read the book and you've got to get the basis of information first. So I highly encourage you to go pick that up. You can get it at Barnes & Noble. You can pick it up at Walmart or Target or Amazon or any other major book outlet. This is Dr. Osborne with the Pig Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. I'm so happy that you spent your Monday evening with me. Hope you have a great rest of your week and we will be back again next Monday, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Take care. Hey, if you've got a functional medicine or health question that you'd like me to answer for you, make sure you send me an email, glutenology at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to create a video answer just for you. Have a great day.